great. Well, thank you all for coming out on this really great night. Um, I appreciate it. Um, my name is Tiffany Trent, and I am the Communications Manager here at Virginia Bioinformatics Institute. I am also a young adult science fiction and fantasy author. Um, and I thought, um, having done a talk at the library in May about this very issue, um, that it would be fun to actually get some scientists and some authors together and see what they think about things. Um, and so I decided to go ahead and do that as part of the Virginia Science Festival. Um, I'm going to apologize right now because my, my voice has been off and on for the past few days, so if I start getting hoarse, um, sorry about that. Um, but the first thing we go ahead and introduce our guests. Um, we have Angie Smybert. Um, Angie is native from Blacksburg, but um, she's worked at she's worked here at Virginia Tech, but she's also worked at um, NASA Kennedy Space Center. Um, she is now a young adult science fiction author. Um, her books can be found um, outside. All of our books, those of us who have books, are outside. Um, if you're interested, at the end of the talk. And um, she has been on the Yalsa Best Fiction and Next Street list. So, welcome, Andy. Um, Bob, he is a, Bob Robinson is our next guest. Um, he is a program director at NSF by day. Um, he specializes in researching the Aurora Borealis, but he's also a science fiction author. So that's really fun. And I have him in the middle on purpose, which is kind of cool. <laughs> um, and then uh, uh, Dr. Skip Garner is our Director of Medical Informatics and uh, Systems Division here at BDI. Um, and Skip, I, and you can, all can add whatever you like, but I have here, um, because your CV is huge, um, that basically the you know, background in physics and are working in the dark matter of DNA, um, which I still love your name, the International Dark Matter Laboratory. So, um, what I want to do is just, since this is a bit more intimate than I was paying, which is fine, um, I will ask some questions, but I think we could maybe open it up to discussion a little earlier than I had planned. And I, I think we'd all be amenable to that and just have it be more of a kind of flow, let it just sort of be guided. I think you want to know. But just to start it off, um, part of what started this for me was starting to read about this movement that um, Neil Stevenson, the author of Snow Crash, has started, um, which is that he he, um, he first published an essay in Wired um, in which he wrote, in early 2011, I participated in a conference called Future Tense, where I lamented the decline of the manned space program that pivoted to energy, indicating that the real issue isn't about rockets. It's our far broader inability as a society to execute on the base stuff. I had, through some kind of blind luck, struck a nerve. Because what happened after that was that the president of Arizona State University, Michael Crow, replied, sort of pointing a finger at him, well, you guys, you science fiction authors, are the ones who are slacking off. It's your fault um, that we're not actually dealing with things um, anymore. So Stevenson then, um, I guess the two of them sort of met on common ground, and uh, Stevenson has helped found the Center for Science and Imagination at the ASU, um, which will soon see the publication of an anthology in which there are no hackers, no hyperspace, and no holocaust, avoiding both the pessimism and magical technologies, as he calls it, like um, hyperdrive. Um, and things like that, the current science fiction. Um, so that's sort of the frame that I have for tonight in thinking about this stuff. Um, how would you all respond to that? This whole thing about science fiction is too negative, it needs to be more positive. Um, well, I'm of two minds of, about this. Can you hear me? Um, because I've seen, you know, I've worked at NASA, I've seen the kind of the demise of the space program, and yet, you know, I, you know, I probably write the kind of, had written the kind of stuff that he's saying, oh, we shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't be writing this. Um, 
I've seen like you know all the, the scientists and engineers that and animators and whoever I worked with at NASA were all like inspired by you know Star Trek and all the science fiction and the, you know the positive science fiction of the 70s. Um, so I, I really see his point on that. However, you know, really the reason why we weren't getting anywhere in the space program had to do with political, you know, political will. Nobody wanted to pay for us to go anywhere. Um, and, you know, you see things changing from year to year from president, because I worked at the space, Kennedy Space Center for about 10 years, so I got to see d different administrations. It didn't matter whether it was de Democratic or Republican, it was just like, Okay, well this year we're not going, we're not doing this anymore. We're doing something else. And a lot of it was because, well, okay, well, we have to try out a few things, but then, okay, well, there's nobody say, saying, okay, well we gotta go to the moon right now. Or we gotta go to Mars right now. So that's why I'm of two minds. I think he's right to some degree, but I think the real reason why we're not doing those things is because politics, <laughs> you know. I'm not sure this is working. Can you hear me okay? Um, sure. That's, that's all right. So I, th I think Neil Stevenson is sort of partially correct in the sense that um, we, we have failed to um, be visionary in terms of identifying what the next big accomplishment should be and working toward that, that, that goal. Um, but I, I think maybe what he's missing is the fact that so many uh, huge accomplishments don't happen at one time. They happen very slowly and incrementally. And if you were to ask, when was the internet invented, or when were TVs invented, or how was uh, uh, space travel enabled? They, these, these things came about incrementally through gradual progress and gradual scientific uh, understanding. And then at the end, it's easy to look back and see how it was done, but, but uh, I don't think it's as bleak as Neil Stevenson is saying. I think there is still an incredible amount of progress going on in science now. But I, but I do think that we need a vision, especially when it comes to uh, space travel and colonization. Well, I have to say <clears throat> that the, the most disappointing literature that I've ever read is my rejection letters for <laughs> being a uh, mission specialist. And I have a stack of them. so. Uh, it's, that's more science fact than science fiction. But I, I would say that there's actually a role in science fiction for something other than inspiration. There's also a role for trying to illustrate some of the issues of the day. And so I, I'll just say one of my uh, favorite uh, science fiction movies is The Day Deer Stood Still. It's in that genre of the 60s fear of nuclear annihilation, right? And so it's this warning from outer space. And, and so I think that, that science fiction doesn't have the limited role of inspiring people, but it also has, has a political role and a variety of other roles as well. Uh, I do like my good you know, space cowboys, though. So. <laughs> That's great. Um, and that kind of, it sounds sort of like we've got, you know, we've got the, we've got various functions for it that are maybe a little bit more refined than just what Neil is talking about, about, you know, it needs to inspire, but it needs to do other things too. And um, it ta he talks about um, science fiction's greatest contribution being um, to show how new technologies function in the web of social and economic systems. Um, would you say, how do you feel about that? Do you think that's accurate or is that, you know, is, is there more to it than that? I'd say there's more to it than that. I mean, I think that's one thing that you can do as, you know, your science fiction or what you mentioned. It's also a, uh, you know, the opposite. Okay, how would you, what would happen if this, you know, runs away and you extrapolate to this and you see, uh, you know, you see what you shouldn't be doing. You know, the, so I think there's a wide range of roles for science fiction. It's, it's difficult to generalize about science fiction because there's so many there's so many different types. I think in, in some science fiction uh, work, 
is set up where the technology then drives the resulting human response. Mm -hmm. But but in but in other works, it's it's uh, it's how the, the how the human influence um, dictates and and directs technology. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a there, there's roles for science fiction anywhere, and, and I think one of the biggest roles for science fiction is just um, getting people to imagine, uh, getting people to think outside their normal uh, routines and out of their normal um, set of experiences and ask what if or, or, or speculate about different scenarios and different ideas. That, that's where the enlightenment comes from science fiction. Well, actually, I'm in favor of, and I'd like to see more science fiction uh, that is based on, and adheres to kind of like our current understanding of, of plausible science, right? And I know that you like to go way, you know, fantasy way far uh, from that. But I think that there uh, is a, a, a position to inspire, but also it would be, uh, uh, it would be really good if some of the, uh, of the concepts on which, you know, we operate as a scientist every day uh, can also be employed so that uh, the people who are the readers can, can realize that there's a, a type of science fiction that, that, you know, doesn't have laser blasters and stuff that violate uh, our laws. And I think that there's plenty of room to write science fiction in there. I, I'd like to see more of that. Yeah, can you, that would segue perfectly into my next question. I mean, can you all talk a little bit about what is actually possible? I mean, I know mean, there are some sort of like right now, it's because you know Ebola is so much in the news. This isn't on my mind, but um, you know the hot zone, an outbreak. These are like things that were based on the the uh, rest in Ebola. I don't know if all of you know that there's a strain of Ebola that um, was identified in rest in Virginia, um, and it, it only infects monkeys, thankfully. But you know, outbreak took that to like the next step and and made it into this you know horrible. Um, epidemic scenario. Um, you know, we have lots of zombie movies that do the same thing. But I mean, what kinds of technologies or um, research areas that, that you all are familiar with that do you feel are sort of unexplored right now, or that would be easy to really um, write something that's kind of plausible but interesting? Well, I think there's a, a huge amount. Actually, there's a physicist in me uh, doesn't like to, to really see a lot of things where you have to, to really violate a lot of basic physics principles. But I do like it, you know, a good warp drive every once in a while. <laughs> uh, but, but the thing that the biologist in me recognizes that, you know, this, this uh, after all, we're now in the, uh, the, the brain, right, is supposed to be the big inspiration. So I think there's a lot in this, uh, in this area of, of where we are now as far as uh, how advanced our brain is and where it can go into the future and uh, unexplored possibilities uh, there and uh, in the, the neurosciences and, uh, and, and of course the whole idea of having things like synthetic biology where you can uh, you know, come up with something on the computer but you can actually make it and you can make it live. And this is, this is acceptable, this is stuff that we can order out today. And so uh, you can start going through a lot more possibilities than I've seen in the literature on how uh, that could, uh, could be kind of predictive of, of the future, which I think is one of the roles of science fiction, is to, is to lay down you know, the gauntlet of possibilities. And, uh, and so uh, I would... Uh, uh, I could imagine that there could be a lot more stories uh, in in that area. So, I, I don't know if people really appreciate how how privileged we are to be living at the time that we're living because this this is the time when we have shown definitely that there are uh, Earth-like planets outside our solar system, thousands of them throughout the galaxy. And, and I think the, uh, that discovery, I mean, 
that that is almost as tantamount as as actually fi finding alien life. There's always been this question about whether there's alien life out there or not, and and we still don't haven't answered that. But but we have answered the one big question: is that there are, there has to be other Earth-like planets, planets going around suns that are similar to our sun in what they call the habitable zone, and 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 the and the pathway to life once you have the right conditions is fairly well established and fairly well understood and uh, and and fairly common so um, so that that opens up huge opportunities for science fiction just imagining the different worlds that might be out there and what kind of uh, and the interactions between the, those worlds once they get discovered and well and that is the kind of thing I'd like to see too that see more, and in the young adult world, like more actual stories about it, going out and exploring, and, uh, you know, I was, I won't tell you what book it was, but I was reading something about uh, Mars, and they were, you know, it was a young adult book about Mars, and I thought the first chapter was wonderful, because it was very, like, okay, this is what it would like to be, be a minor on Mars during this colonization period, and then kind of went off into some other direction that just didn't make sense, but I would, you know, I was hungry to see something like that, and actually, you know, maybe, sleep, you know, stories about sleeper ships going out to, you know, colonize somewhere, and, you know, have us looking outward, I guess, more mm -hmm. than looking inward, but I kind of, I think, you know, with more, the more we have, like, in the news, things like Ebola and things like that, we might see a resurgence of, like in the 90s, we had a bunch of, of fiction about the hot zone and, you know, plagues taking over, you know, and turning into zombies and all sorts of things like that. So I think a lot of it, the fiction also reacts to the things that are going on around us. And we don't stay ahead of that curve. Yeah. If I can, if I can yeah. just add, just just to recognize the fact that so much science fiction is market driven, ultimately, yeah. and, yeah. and uh, you know, all science fiction novelists they they're very passionate about the science and, mm -hmm. and and the worlds that they create, but then then again they we all have to sell books, so uh, so they're going to look at what's what's selling, and I think mm -hmm. maybe what the, the lapse that Neil Stevenson has has seen. Uh, is a period when sort of the computer technology, the video games, and took us into these different realms of, of uh, more fantasy than science fiction. Um, and so science fiction became less based on true science and more on these fantasy worlds that people created. Well, and we've seen recently more dystopian books that are, you know, it's either an apocalypse or it's um, some part of society that's out of whack, which I think there is definitely a place for that, because that gives you a, a chance to explore different things that, about what, because you're always writing about what's going on today. So it's a way to comment on what we're, you know, what you see today, but putting it in a, a more palatable context. But I, so I think that kind of, that's been the trend for a while, just because I think there's a certain, uh, gloominess to things going on in the world today and so that's been reflected in what we're writing and what people think like people as in the editors and the, or think that people are buy, want to buy so that's what a lot of drives that well robert's comments about habitable exoplanets kind of reminds me of a uh, of a portion of a, a meeting i was at two two months ago that uh, it's a meeting called Saifu. I got the T-shirt, uh, and uh, th this uh, this meeting is 200 people gathered together that are kind of scientists and technologists and dreamers and things like this, and uh, three days at, at Google. And so, if it wasn't for the fact that we knew that it was a serious meeting, if you actually walked into any any session that's going on, there's always five parallel sessions going on, that you wouldn't know that it wasn't a science fiction kind of writers conference, and that uh, I remember I, I, there was one uh, lunchtime session, and it was uh, the, uh, the guy who was coordinating was the director of the JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab, and they had, you know, 
geneticists and other people there. And the question was, well, how do you, uh, uh, it, it's, the guy from JPL said, well, assume, and it's, it's pretty certain, and we can at least do uh, 0.1c, and so we'll be able to get humans to an exoplanet, or get, get living material from this planet to another exoplanet. And so how would you best get uh, you know, humans or human genomes to another planet? And so the discussion was, well, uh, you know, how, do you, uh, how do you prepare hu humans in this case? Uh, the discussion was, really, if you're going to send something like a human or something living, there's going to get so much radiation. But nonetheless, we know how to make radio-resistant genomes. And so, well, we'd have to start reprogramming people right now to make them radioactive, you know, resistant to, to kind of space environments. And so this, the thing is, is that this is doable right now. And so this is uh, the guy from JPL instructing the biologists what we really need to do for, for humans, okay? And then, you know, the alternative came up was, well, you don't really need to send a whole human. What you need to do is a few cells and the ability to actually make those cells then, then make a human when you're on the other end. And it gets, gets rid of a lot of the kind of overhead on your spaceship that the JPL guy was worried about. And so, this is, uh, you know, again, if you walked in the middle of this, you wouldn't know that this was serious kind of, well, it was out there science considerations, but this was, was trying to come up with a real plan as opposed to, well, this is kind of an interesting story. You know, so I, I think that it's, uh, and that went on for three days, but I, I guess it's one of the things that illustrates that perhaps we're at a place in today's society and technology, and et cetera, where it could be, uh, things are happening so fast, it can be very hard to, deter to, to really know what, what is science fiction today and it's really going to be science tomorrow because the paper just hasn't come out yet, you know. Uh, it could be tomorrow. Right. And, and there are so many approaches to it. And I was just thinking about things that we do here. We're all looking, sometimes we're looking at the same problem, but we're using a bunch of different lenses to do it. You know, um, or or just people in the general field are, and there's so much information that we're completely overwhelmed by the information. You know, just trying to make sense of what the information is. You know, so how is then you spend all this time trying to figure out how do I get through that information to actually get to something that I can um, make an action plan. You know, because there's so many pathways to it. But yeah, it, it's fascinating. Um, you're talking about the, the cell carrying, maybe just carrying cells and not people. Um, I was at a workshop. There's a, a workshop at the University of Wyoming called Launchpad. And if you are ever interested in um, learning more about um, astrophysics and physics and things like that, um, and you want, you know, for, for writing or whatever, um, it's a great thing to apply to, but it's like a crash course a week. And, and I, I was just talking, about, I'm always looking at things from a biological perspective, and I said to the astrophysicists, hey, did you know that bears, when they hibernate, lose their muscle or bone mass? You know, because that's a real problem. With humans who are kept still, we lose muscle mass. You know, like if you're, um, invalid or something like that and you can't um, exercise. Um, but bears bears don't do that. And he went, really? <laughs> and then I think that's gonna show up as next couple. And then I was like, no, 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 the bears are mine. The bears are mine. You can't have them. <laughs> but you know, it's things like that. That um, you know different ways of trying to approach the same problem. But um, I thought it might be good if you all have questions. See if you guys want to sort of drive the conversation a little bit. Do you have questions or? Yeah, I have like 15 questions. Okay. <laughs> I'll start by very generally saying, um, I come from a science fiction family, and it's always been kind of exhausting. Like, okay, cool with the Star Trek and the, the books and, just, and all the conventions, but ultimately, it's always been the most um, imaginative space in a way that the scientists and the, and the artists in my family, we all get together and agree on that one thing. So I think, as far as his ASU presidents, like, I don't even really understand what he's criticizing and what he was wrong with what he's saying. It's very confusing to me. Mm -hmm. But in terms of um, a few of us here, we're in the STS department, science technology studies, and we think a lot about alternate worlds, not in a fantasy way, but in a ethical way. How do we want to exist? And I think that 
regardless of how much information, like in bio or other disciplines, that authors do acquire or pick up or something. What's, I think what I would hope for more, if, there's, if I could hope for something in science fiction writing in the future that I would hope for it, would be one where um, the way that we interpret all this scientific technology and stuff, instead of how can me as a person who is a biologist or a physicist, how can I come up with something? It's, well, how can I in my contextual moment? So for me, I don't know, like, I'm the only brown person in this room, right? So like, what about more uh, queer people of color? Like, the, the person who's writing it themselves has a story and, a, you know, and, and it's a compliment from nothing, rather. So this idea of like a, a, having a, a deficit model of information, we just need to have more information to create these books that then inspire more scientists to create rockets in certain ways or whatever. That sounds really dull and, and like flattening to me. So what, how can more of the science fiction authors out there be, tap into who they are as human beings? You know, why do we have to exit our bodies in order to be imaginative? Awesome. <laughs> I don't think we do. I mean, what interests me about science fiction is not necessarily the science part. You know, I have a science degree and, uh, you know, worked at NASA, but I'm more interested in, okay, well, how do people react in, in that situation? Um, and I think I hear you also saying, okay, well, I mean, because there's a lot of talk, at least in young adult fiction, science fiction nowadays about, okay, well, we definitely need more diverse uh, you know, in you know, many aspects, to, you know, diversity represented in the fiction because people want to see, especially teenagers, they want to be able to see themselves in the future. And themselves aren't all white, you know, so there needs to be, you know, a more, uh, a more diverse look from us as to what the future is going to look like in terms of people. I mean, and I don't mean like, any bio, you know, biological engineering, but it's just, okay, what are we going to be like as humans or as a population or, you know, just, you know, culturally? So what you're talking about is kind of what I'm more interested in. Yeah. You have a very cool family. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I don't know about other science fiction authors, but I, I always thought, you know, as, as difficult as the science and the technology is, um, the most difficult part of writing for me is making it a human story. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately it's going to be humans that read it, and, and you want to make it appealing in that way. And, and one of the things that, that I try to do to sort of help myself uh, in that way is, is science fiction is, is, is just history only in the future. So going back and, and looking at history gives you a different pr perspective. It gives you a perspective about how our civilization has evolved, um, how people change, how populations change, um, how diversity um, um, varies uh, through the ages. And so the, so the real trick is to take what we know about the past and extrapolate it into the future and try to use those principles and those guidelines to make some sort of uh, uh, rational, um, build some rational stories around, around that. But it is, uh, it is, it, it's key to always bring it back to, to, to the humans. Well, you know, uh, I think scientists are human too, and so uh, you know, always having the weird scientists in the science fiction is, is a little bit disturbing for me. But uh, I would I would say a couple things. One is uh, science fiction could also learn from real life, and I don't know if you've heard of the LC program, uh, ELS, Ethical, Legal, and Social Issues. So when the Human Genome Project was launched, uh, it was uh, three billion dollars. Well, they carved off five percent of that budget for LC. And so uh, knowing that this was going to have a dramatic Im impact on society, on uh, issues of diversity, you know, uh, what is it to be human? What is it to be, you know, is there a, uh, what's it, how's it gonna affect medicine? How's it gonna affect uh, how you define an African-American versus an African, you know, or whatever. And so 
these are all issues that uh, that they knew was going to uh, that the existence of this very data is going to cause controversy and potential social problems and things like this. And so, uh, five percent of three billion dollars has been spent so far. And if you actually go and read some of that stuff, okay, I, I've actually published in this area too. That if you read it, uh, you can. You can see that they're, they're actually not just thinking about, well, you know, can you, uh, uh, can insurance companies deny you insurance for a pre existing condition that's encoded in your genome? Well, it turns out no. Uh, Obamacare, you know, said, said formalized that legal decision. But actually, if you read it, they're working on concepts that, that go 20 years and way into the future about real issues, and you could certainly borrow some of those and plop them into some great science fiction stories, in my opinion. And then I, I want to also say that uh, the, I, would, I would also predict with the movement away from hard copy printing where the version of the story that's created and is printed is, is that's what you get, to the electronic version uh, will enable a lot of possibilities on how you publish in the future. Uh, as you know, that there's also there are already stories that have multiple endings. You know, you can predict you want to have the catastrophic ending, the happy ending, the, the whatever. So there's stories like this. There's there's no reason to think that we're limited by that. Okay. So uh, so what would you say that? Well, I I would like to have, uh, you know, I'd like to buy this science fiction book or this book. Uh, electronically, but I want to customize it so I want my main character to be African American, all right, and and not you know something else. Okay, you can write the story, but you can also substitute in things that can make for an infinity of diversity attractive to multiple audiences and, and individuals. You know, uh, uh, I, I can just tell you, and you know that. I like uh, uh, powerful women in science fiction, okay? So I would go, I want my, uh, my main character to be Sigourney Weaver, you know, the Sigourney Weaver type person, right? And uh, my wife's back there probably laughing because she knows I watch these kind of, you know, these kind of movies because I like, you know, these kick-ass female, you know, uh, first, first three shooters or whatever they are. And so it would be great to, to uh, to get science fiction books where you can you could actually just make decisions electronically as to you know how you want to be re uh, uh, represented in any diversity in any plane you know whether it's you know uh, genetic diversity or uh, you know or so some social classification diversity you could do all that stuff it wouldn't take very hard to do that maybe we've got a new publishing company here. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just standing here going huh. <laughs> this is really interesting. An interesting idea. Other questions? That was a great one. Yeah. Um, so this kind of gets back to the discussion between Neil Stevenson and the president of ASU. Um, I mean, it, to me, it seems like the disagreement there is over the responsibility that scientists have to science fiction writers and that science fiction writers have to scientists. Um, and because you guys are a really interesting mix of like science and fiction, I was wondering like what was your take on that? Um, do scientists have certain responsibilities to science fiction writers? Do science fiction writers have responsibilities to scientists? Well, I have a hard time thinking about that. There's a responsibility, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, I, I think that uh, certainly when I was a young kid, I was inspired by you know the science fiction. I was. Uh, uh, reading and seeing on on TV uh, and black and white TV, by the way, uh, and and so on three channels, and so the uh, that, however, I I wouldn't like it said that there was a, a responsibility to to say that to to try and make something enforceable that you know you're science fiction writer you need to write things like this, uh, and and similarly scientists. Uh, you know, really don't have a responsibility to create the new laser weapon, but nonetheless, at the same time, we create enough cool new things that, that can open up the possibilities in science fiction. You just have 
to have a little bit of time as a science fiction writer to, to sit and think about it, you know? Uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, was awarded yesterday to the guys who invented blue lasers, right? Uh, blue LEDs that, uh, that and so uh, it's made it made uh, it's it's made it possible for us to reduce you know 30 percent of the total uh, uh, energy consumption of the planet because 30 percent is waste is used in lighting that's not efficient and so where would you go with that okay uh, and what would you do with that 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 instrument is not just lighting but it's also the heart of all of our DVD players and you know and how do we record information and, and we're creating a lot of information and how would you record it and distort it and all kinds of things. there's there's plenty of places where you could go. Uh, I just think that uh, that science fiction writers should uh, should probably have a their kind of their standards that they're they're reading in science. You know, they you would want to perhaps read some papers like some journals like Science and Nature and some odds and ends like this, but you probably want to be at uh, at Scientific American kind of level, where there's uh, there's they kind of pick up on the stories from everywhere, and it's more layperson. You can kind of grasp it and run with it. And so I, I think there's plenty of stuff out there without having to enforce a responsibility. I think maybe a better uh, description of the relationship is it's really a symbi symbiotic relationship between uh, scientists and, and and science fiction writers. Um, they. Uh, they, they sort of feed off each other, right? And and I think what's what's uh, great about the age that we live in, it, it is an age of information, and, and 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 maybe it's not all great information, but there's volumes of it, and it's easily accessible, and and you can go and and, uh, and clicks away from science fiction and science fact, and and I don't know about other science fiction authors, but it's, it's accumulating all those bits and pieces of science fiction and science fact that really ultimately goes into uh, a work of science fiction, and I think it ultimately inspires science as, as well, too. And I think it's very critical um, because of the uh, growth and availability of information is that um, young people, our whole population has to be very scientifically literate. So you, that you can tell the difference between good science and bad science, good information and bad information, because it can be misused too. But, uh, I think we're getting there. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of where the responsibility lies. I think there's a good, you know, between science fiction writer and scientist, I think, like you said, there's a symbiosis that we feed off, hopefully you do feed off of each other. But then I think as a writer, you have a responsibility to the reader um, to, you know, do your, do your homework, basically, you know, and, okay, yeah, if it's something that is blatantly not, like, based in science, that's fine, but if you are, like, purporting to make this science fiction, well, do your, you know, make sure you are knowledgeable of that, know what you write about. Um, but I think there's also a responsibility on the scientist end and the public maybe to like increase that literacy. I think there's definitely sort of a deficit of science literacy that hope maybe science fiction writers could help with, but you know, somebody like Neil deGrasse Tyson really helps with, you know, like uh, you know, Cosmos goes a long way to helping inspire you know, kids to learn more about the science and maybe become like him or become, you know, later on, maybe become a science fiction writer or, go, you know, make that, you know, those kind of movies. You know? Well, I want to just tell you about a scientific exchange mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that I was watching in real time between uh, the author of Jurassic Park and a bioinformatician called, uh, Mark, named Mark Boguski. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, uh, if you look in the book in Jurassic Park, there's actually a, a paragraph size section that includes some DNA sequence. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so this was about cloning, you know, dinosaurs into frogs or whatever. Well, it turns out that Mark Boguski, a, a well-known bioinformatician, you know, he of course did what any good bioinformatician would do, and it was he 
he typed that stuff into his computer and searched for it and, and showed, it, showed it was not a relevant genome. And of course, he wrote to the author. And this, uh, this was done in uh, kind of open. And, uh, and it, was, it was kind, but you know, said it was, you kind of made a mistake. And the acknowledgment of that is actually, if you go and you get the second Jurassic Park book, you'll see there's another DNA sequence in there. But if you take that DNA sequence, and in the right frame, you translate it into the protein domain, which has a lot more letters, you'll see there's a message in there to mark. <laughs> so that's not well known, but it, it, it's there. So, so there is an absolute and direct interplay between hardcore scientists and science fiction writers, and uh, they know it and like it, and you know, it happens. I saw a lot of people yelling about Doctor Who. When we were talking about it before it started. Up. I, I didn't actually see it, but evidently something came out of the moon last week, <laughs> and there were a lot of people like, ah, what is that? You know, doing Stephen Moffat. Um, <laughs> but, but the underlying message of that one was actually good because at the very end. The, the doctor's like, okay, well, this is what inspired you people to get off your butt and get back out into space. Because it was, you know, they'd gone through a period where, uh, you know, all the, well, like now all the shuttles were in mothballs, but, you know, there was no way to get to the point. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there was something crazy that came out of it. <laughs> something crazy came out of it. Interesting. Other questions? Yeah. I was just curious as to what each of you would like the next big scientific accomplishment to be? Like, what, if you could choose anything to work on, what would you like it to be? I'm a on the scientific accomplishment. I'll take a shot at yeah. it. Okay. Uh, I, since we, we just talked about the shuttles and stuff mm -hmm. like this, the, the, the commercialization of space, okay? That's going to drive down the cost, and because I want my seat uh, to at least do a, you know, kind of a, a little bit of a low space kind of uh, entry, and uh, it's getting the price is going to drop. Uh, and actually, if you go back into science fiction, there's some old science fiction stories about how uh, there's a few of them about where uh, people had. Uh, abandoned space because of the cost and stuff like that, and it wasn't until some commercial entity found value in it that actually kind of caused it to resurrect and, and to really uh, drive uh, our exploitation and use of space. And I think that we're right where that's actually going to happen now. You know, and again, science fiction is supposed to be a big predictor of this, these kind of things. And so uh, I would like to see that because I like the, the average cost of a seat to to not just be first class, but to let you know all the rest of us go too. Well, I will I will agree with that one since it is, I think not necessarily like the commercial, you know, like uh, what is Richard Branson's, you know, thing, but more like Elon Musk's SpaceX, where okay, well we actually are going out and doing stuff, you know, let's go to the asteroids like we are doing, you know, there's a mission to the asteroids to. You know, so let's see what you know what they're made of, and I think something like that, you know, will drive. Okay, somebody's figured out how to make money out of space, other than like, you know, the you know I would like my seat too, but uh, you know I think that's not going to drive it. I think there's some something some gold out there that they're going to, you know, gold rush at spa in space would be good. You know, that would drive us to want to go out. So, so I'm a space scientist, but I'm going to disagree. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go with the brain. I think, I think being able to um, simulate the function, the functioning of the brain, either through computers or, or um, some vast uh, inter uh, advanced internet network or, or some, get, getting to that kind of functionality because we. We, we are still so far away from understanding how well, how, how the brain works as well as it does. And, and I think that we're, we're, we're with the brain uh, program, I think we're, we're starting to sort of pick away and try to get at sort of the, the fundamental mechanisms, what's going on. And once we get to the point where we can simulate, even, even on a small scale, that kind of functionality, 
I think that would be a huge advancement. Yeah, maybe the biggest advancement is improving ourselves. Yes. You know, and of course that's been in a lot of science fiction stories, and often you know it, it ended up as a disaster or something like this. But uh, but nonetheless, we are improving ourselves continuously, and uh, and we can do it more wisely. And and as we get better and better at making uh, modifying people's genomes, uh, there's no reason why you can't just defeat disease, but also just improve the, the, the basic human as well. And uh, uh, I think, you know, again, I, I just think that's further off, <laughs> you know? And, uh, but I certainly would like to have that shot, you know, that, that would help. Yeah, when you start talking about expanding um, and colonizing other planets or uh, advancing civilizations, you have to be very careful what part of civilization you're advancing. <laughs> you want to make sure that uh, uh, that any colony uh, um, takes the best of what humans have to offer and, and propagates that in space. You can go badly wrong that way. But, but it, it, isn't that in, in complete opposition to what history tells us? This, this country, this continent got colonized by Europeans of the worst kind <laughs> come here and exploit it for whatever they can get out of it. And if humans, us, are anything, if we find something, another planet, whatever, it, if we can exploit it, we will. And a few centuries, a few million years from now, that planet will have half the population of other animals and species that it had before, just as we are now. I think the most important thing we have to learn to do from a science point of view, from a technology point of view, is to be able to use the instruments that we have very powerful, whether they be improving our brain, whether they be information, whatever it is, to be able to manage ourselves and to live in a society in peace. And until we can do that, where we're going to be a century from now, we'll be in one of the dystopian sciences, science fiction, that you, that you know of. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't very long from Ender's Game to drones. Mm -hmm. And now we have kids sitting in Arizona, sending drones to the Middle East to blow up whatever they can see. Mm -hmm. And it was not a very few years. Mm -hmm. we, have to, we have to understand the origin of those human frailties, those human tendencies um, that, that, that cause us to make those kind of mistakes. And once we understand the origins of those things, I think we have a better, much better chance of fixing them and, and uh, finding a new, new way forward. Well, there's, there's both science and science fiction where that, that discusses that debate and, you know, the things that make you great. Are are the the characteristics of, of being driven or being the dominant uh, whatever you know what would you call bad characteristics versus good characteristics? I think there's even a Star Trek mm -hmm. show or, uh, you know on that which you know it's it's the uh, some of the 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 things that you would characterize as the worst characteristics are the ones that actually drive us to make progress. Okay, so I think that is also part of the debate that is that's illustrated and taken on by science fiction that uh, that's possible there uh, that that doesn't get traction elsewhere it certainly doesn't get traction in the Senate <laughs> you know and so uh, however it may get traction if there's enough and and there's good enough uh, predictions that start mapping right on top of some of these science fiction uh, predictions uh, to, to make us make adjustments to how we are using our planet. Mm -hmm. Look at Dune. Mm -hmm. Just look at Dune. I was like, Dune! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all I need to look at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I forgot to say thank you guys <laughs> so much. Just to say that now. And also, um, is there, a, I know it's a wide gamut of subgenres within science fiction, so forgive me if this is not the answer to this question, but 
is it possible to write science fiction where um, there's no progress and not how to be dystopian? So the point of, that you were making about um, neuroscience will, un like, will reveal why we behave so badly to each other, why we do what these can think about, you know? You know? Uh, but what if science goes however it goes and it turns out that we can't answer everything and the next part of that story is not Oh my God! Everything falls apart because science can't answer every question on the planet. Oh my God! We're going to fall. But actually, hey, it's cool. Like some things don't need to. You can just let it go. How would a society look like that, where we just stop dreaming that we can answer everything with a lab experiment? Well, you just started your own science fiction story, right? <laughs> uh, so you you could come up with, uh, you know, there's probably a, a bunch of different ways you could take a story like that, and so, you know. Take shot. I mean, is there other narratives that aren't that don't follow the Western progress narrative, where we're just getting better and better and better, and eventually, even who we are as individual sentient beings becomes a matter of equations and calculations? Well, they're kind of few and far between, but mm -hmm. there are there's like a tiny subgenre, like I think it's called mundane science fiction, where it's like okay, we don't look at okay, we don't really ever like leave the planet. You know, we deal with what's here and what's, you know, sort of immediately possible. And it's kind of like what you described. What would that world look like? Um, it's not, I think, the really commercially popular kind of science fiction, but there are people thinking along that way, those lines. Because, yeah, it doesn't have to be that we keep getting better and better. I mean, that's one of the questions of science fiction is, uh, and one of the gentleman behind you raised is, okay, well, you have that, okay, that drive for, you know, doing whatever versus, okay, should we be better people? And does that ever happen? Um, you know, and it would be interesting to have, you know, a story or even a, a genre of where, okay, well, let's not take this Western, okay, everything gets, keeps going up. We just, we go in some other direction. So I, I'd also suggest that a couple of the books that have actually been mentioned during this kind of follow that same line. So actually an awful lot of what Neil Stevenson writes is is fairly non-progress. I mean, the fundamental mm -hmm. conceit of Snow Crash is what if Second Life had a better UI? And that's <laughs> not you know, a huge leap forward or something like that. Yeah. Um, but this is actually kind of a question that follows that idea of the responsibility between scientists and science fiction writers, but it's kind of a more internal question for those of you who do both, uh, which is, it's, it's funny that you mentioned the hot zone, because I'm uh, an infectious disease epidemiologist at BBI, and the thing that has made social media the most difficult to manage for the past couple months has been the hot zone and outbreak, and that's people's conception of Ebola. So, um, how do you balance the, the desire to, to tell good science with the desire to have a good story? Um, which are sometimes uh, kind of mutually strengthening goals, but I think sometimes in opposition. Just how personally, as writers, do you manage that? Well, I think since I do have a science background, but I wouldn't call myself a scientist. I, you know, have just sort of the basic degree and all that. I, you know, I do still feel kind of like the responsibility to to balance that, like the the strengthening, uh, you know, one strengthening the other. Uh, but I think a lot, some people do kind of like go the other direction and there's probably a push to go to the other direction, like to value the story over the science, uh, you know, and that's because that might be what's selling, you know. And so it is kind of, I think it's a personal thing with the writer that, you know, you have to, and, and there's also this thing, you know, in writing called verisim verisimilitude, where it's like, okay, I've done, you know, I've written something, I'm like, but that's the way it is, and the editor will go, well, nobody will believe that, you know, but that's the real, you know, this is really how it works. I'm like, well, but, yeah. So there is kind of a balancing of, okay, you got to make it look, you know, pay homage to the reality of it, whereas trying to make it look real to people who are used to reading, like, something like Outbreak or, you know, or the hot zone, where it's gone the other way. So it's a balancing act, I think. 
I'm a, I'm a scientist, and, and, and writing is, is, is an art form. So it, it's, it's, hard, it's hard for me as a scientist to be a writer, because in any art, the, the, the real critical part is sort of narrowing down from, from the infinity of different stories that you could write, or pictures you could paint, or uh, to sort of narrowing it down and, and, and uh, putting it into a package that you can put into a book and write about. And I find that the science uh, provides that constraint. So, and so things can't just go anywhere. You, you're constrained by the scientific reality of, of, of what can happen. So that, that gives me some comfort when I'm putting together a story. Well, that's why I guess I could write it. <laughs> But it's still fiction, though, right? And so, by definition, right. it's fiction. I'm struggling with that issue right now. So, <laughs> I know that I want something a certain way, and I'm angry that I can't do it according to the laws of physics. But anyway, we'll see. I might just do it anyway. Um, any other questions? Well, thank you all very much for coming. I appreciate it. Um, folks are out there, if you'd like to take a look, um, feel free to, and we can get them signed. Um, um, feel free to come up and ask more questions if you'd like. But thanks a lot. <laughs>